الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله All praise is due to Allah May Allah's peace and blessings be on his last messenger Muhammad وسلم, and on all the prophets of Allah The topic of this evening's lecture or presentation is that of Christmas in Islam and I chose this topic particularly because this is around the period of time when people start preparing for the celebration of Christmas. Uh, there are Muslims who partake of this celebration in various ways and forms, as well as, of course, non-Muslims who celebrate this. And I felt that there was some information concerning the origin and practice of Christianity in Christmas that both Muslims and non-Muslims should realize, should understand in order to put the practice of Christmas in its correct perspective. Now, by definition, Christmas is the Christian festival celebrated on the 25th of December commemorating the birth of Jesus Christ. And by definition, Muslims are obliged to believe in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. It would therefore seem logical that Muslims should be involved in the celebration of that miraculous birth along with Christians who celebrate it. Especially considering the fact that Muslims in many parts of the world celebrate the birthday of Prophet Muhammad. May Allah peace and blessings be upon him. The goal that I would try to reach in this talk would be the understanding of this uh, question. There seems to be something illogical there. So this is what I would like to like for us to look into. Find out why that is. Because I'm sure uh, most Christians know, and many, most Muslims know also, that Muslims do not celebrate Christmas in general. So this evening I want to try to look to some degree as to why they don't. Now, to understand Christmas, we need to understand what it means, what its origin is from the point of view of Christian scholars themselves. The term Christmas comes from the Old English word Christes Massey, that's Christ, Mass, Mass being a uh, form of worship particular to the Catholic Church and it was first used in the 11th century 11th century that is approximately 1000 years after the time of Christ in other words Jesus Christ never referred to it never spoke of it his disciples never spoke of it they didn't know it In the Romance languages, because this is Old English, the term generally used is Dies Natalis Domini, that is, the day of our Lord's birth. The day of our Lord's birth. That is, indicating that this was the day on which 
the Lord God was born. In terms of the origin of the 25th of December, the scholars hold that no one knows the exact date of birth of Jesus. I'll quote from Collier's Encyclopedia, in which the scholars have said, It is impossible to determine the exact date of the birth of Christ, either from the evidence of the Gospels or from any sound tradition. During the first three centuries of the Christian era, there was considerable opposition in the church to the pagan custom of celebrating birthdays. Very interesting statement. During the first three centuries after the time of Jesus, the official church, Christian church itself, was opposed to the celebration of birthdays, period. Because the celebration of birthdays was a pagan practice. Jews never celebrated their birthdays. Jesus was a Jew. Neither he nor his disciples followed the practice of celebrating birthdays. Birthdays amongst the Greeks and the Romans were celebrated with prayers, sacrifices, and banquets. And it was also the custom to offer presents to the person whose birthday it was. This was a pagan practice. It has no place in the religion which prophets. This is something very fundamental. This is showing us that the origin of the celebration of the birthday was not of divine revelation. It was a, a pagan practice which was incorporated into the practices of the church. The New International Dictionary of the Christian Church states, There is no authoritative historical evidence as to the day or month of Jesus' birth in Jerusalem. Clement of Alexandria mentions the existence of the feast in Egypt of the year 200. And we have some evidence that it was observed on various dates in scattered areas on various days. When you read the writings of the early Christian scholars of the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th century, each one speculated on a different date as to when Jesus might have been born. There was no agreed upon date. And it wasn't until after the conversion of Constantine to Christianity that the church in Rome assigned December the 25th as the date for the celebration of the feast. After the time of Constantine. Now, what does it say? Constantine is in the 4th century. So it wasn't until the 4th century that the 25th of December started being uh, used or as a point of celebration for the birth of Jesus. But even by the end of the 5th century, though it was common in much of the Christian world, the Eastern Church, who are represented today by the Armenians, observed the birth on the 6th of January. And to this day, they still celebrate 
the birthday of Christ on the 6th of January, not the 26th of December. So, the question comes, where did the 25th of December come from? Since nobody knew when it was, where did they get it from? In the time of Constantine. What we find, according to the Collier's Encyclopedia, the choice of December 25th was probably influenced by the fact that on this day the Romans celebrated the Mithraic feast of the birth of the sun god. This feast is called Metalis Solis Invicti. And that the Saturnalia also came at this time. The indications are that the church in this way grasped the opportunity to turn the people away from a purely pagan observance of the winter solstice to a day of adoration of Christ the Lord. Both St. Cyprian and St. John Chrysostom allude to this thought in their writings. The 25th of December was the day on which people who belonged to a cult called Mithraism. The god Mithra was originally a Persian god. He was a one god figure. He was identified with the sun god of Rome and his worship became popular amongst the Romans, especially the army the leaders of the army in fact, Constantine's father was a well known follower of this cult, the Mithraic cult which celebrated the birth of God on the 25th of December and Constantine himself used to follow this prior to his conversion so what we have here is a circumstance where the cult which was most popular in Rome at the time, that of worship of this sun god, Mithra, was incorporated into Christianity as a means by which the leaders of the church gained support, gained followers. In order to make Christianity attractive, more attractive to the Romans and the Greeks, the 25th of December was chosen. There is also another point which is referred to here, it's called the Saturnalia. Now the Saturnalia, this feast which used to be held around the 25th of December also, this is a feast in celebration of the god Saturn. Saturn, we know it as a planet now, but that was the name of one of the Roman gods. He was the god of sowing or of seed. And his festival, the Saturnalia, became the most popular of Roman festivals. It was originally celebrated between the 17th and the 24th of December. And the 25th being the climax. 24th is the last day, 25th is like the climax. So again, we see between the Mithraic cult, the Saturnalia, the worship of the Roman gods, Christianity sought to gain the followers from amongst these two uh, forms of worship, religions which were in existence in the time in Rome, by choosing the 25th of December to attract them. And it's interesting to note that, this is according to the Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics, the Saturnalia in Rome provided the model for most of the merry customs of Christmas time. This old Roman feast was celebrated on the 17th to 24th of December. The time was one of general joy and mirth. During the festival, schools were closed, no punishment was inflicted. In place of the toga, this is the garment, sort of a 
white plastic wrap on itself. Uh, in place of this toga, an undressed garment was worn. Distinction, distinctions of rank were laid aside. Gambling with dice, which at other times were illegal, was permitted and practiced. And all classes of the society exchanged gifts. The most common being clay dolls. These dolls were specially given to children. And when we think back to how Christmas, those of us who come from a Christian background, the idea of the toys and that the children, we see its origin right here in the Patronalia, the pagan celebration of Saturn, the god Saturn. In Northern Europe, the Teutonic tribes celebrated the winter solstice and had developed many customs and traditions that became part of the feast of Christmas when they were converted to Christianity. And we find the peoples of Northern Europe, as they came into Christianity, they had their own uh, practices, festivals, rituals, which were associated with the winter solstice. Winter solstice meaning the 25th of December is like the peak of winter, the time when the day is the shortest. From 25th onwards, the day starts to increase in length again. So the ancient peoples, they saw it like as the rebirth of the sun. The darkness was receding. So you find in many, many different cultures, uh, uh, this practice of celebrating the birth of the sun, the birth of light, etc., you know, being concentrated around the 25th of December. So the Northern European Teutonic tribes, they also had these celebrations. And, as I said, they brought a number of them in with them as they became Christians. In the Middle Ages, the festival became the most popular one of the year, celebrated in church and in home with a blend of pagan usages and Christian devotion. It should be noted, however, that this did not go without any resistance from some people within the church. Because Collier's encyclopedia states, the suppression of the mass during the Reformation led to a sharp change in the observation of Christmas in some countries. In England, the Puritans condemned the celebration and from 1642 to 1652 issued a series of ordinances forbidding all church services and festivities. This feeling was carried over to America by the pilgrims, and it was not until the 19th century wave of Irish and German immigra immigration that enthusiasm for the feast began to spread throughout the country, objections were swept aside, and the old traditions revived among Protestants as well as Catholics. So the church we find in the 17th century, in, Ro in uh, England and in Europe, opposed Christmas. They tried to stop it. They banned the celebration. And initially those who went to America, that was their attitude. But because of the fact that Christianity does not have a found or a sound basis in revelation that is used as a means of determining right and wrong in terms of its practices, then it becomes a question of what is most convenient, who has the most say, what idea is most popular, and we find the religion changing, you know, to suit the time and the place and the people. This is how it has been traditionally. That's why any effort to try to go back to the sources of Christianity, to its purity, fails because the very sources of Christianity in Revelation have been lost. The Christmas tree decorations, you know, the common practice for Christians and Christmas is to make a Christmas tree. 
Some authorities consider the Christmas tree a survival of pagan tree worship and trace it back to ancient Rome and Egypt. The use of evergreens to de decorate homes at Christmas time has an unmistakable pre-Christian origin. During the celebration of the Roman Saturnalia, laurel and other greens and flowers were used extensively for processions and home decorations. In Northern Europe, evergreens, because they did not die in the wintertime, became symbolic of eternal life and were almost objects of worship. Mistletoe was sacred amongst British Druids and were believed to have miraculous powers. So we see usually the decorations, you see these, this green, they call holly, mistletoe, these different green uh, plants which are used to decorate the home, etc. This is coming from the early pagan beliefs in these various plants, either as gods or close to God, or as having certain miraculous or supernatural powers. And this has become a standard practice in Christian tradition. So now, after we've heard all this, and this is without even going into Santa Claus, you know, and that's a whole another story in itself. Having understood this, it is then incumbent on those people who consider themselves to be Christians, followers of Christ. Those who like to quote John 14 verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one cometh unto the Father but by me. I am the way. Jesus' way was the way to be followed. Those who consider themselves Christian should question, are we in fact following the way of Jesus? This celebration of Christmas has nothing to do with the way of Jesus. He neither celebrated his birthday, nor did his disciples celebrate his birthday. And all the pagan practices which have been added to the celebration of Christmas can in no way be pleasing to Jesus. Can in no way be considered a part of his way. Thus, Muslims are not allowed to join in the celebration of Christmas or to offer Christians Christmas greetings, that is, like saying Merry Christmas. Because such an act, the act of celebrating Christmas, or even giving the greeting, Merry Christmas. This would be an open support of paganism. Some people would say, well, Christians, they wish us, you know, Eid Mubarak. When Eid comes, you know, when we have our festivals, so why shouldn't we? wish them also Merry Christmas. Well, the two things are not the same. A practicing Christian, if you were to ask him or her to join in the celebration or to give the greeting to a Satan worshiper, you know you have people who call themselves Satan worshippers. They worship Satan. They have their rites and rituals and practices. They have their celebrations. It might be, or maybe they're witches or warlocks. You know, people around today saying, we're witches and we're warlocks. We have our celebrations, we get together, we have these things. 
for a practicing Christian, if they were asked to join in these celebrations or to offer people the greetings of these signs, a practicing Christian would say, no, how can I do this? This is paganism. Something which would obviously be displeasing to Jesus. Muslims are in a similar light with regards to Christians. How can we share in or offer the greetings to a pagan ritual? No way. Whereas, if a Christian offers Eid Mubarak, you know, blessings of the festival, to Muslims, the Eid al-Adha, what is Eid al-Adha? This is a time when Muslims sacrifice an animal in commemoration of the sacrifice of Abraham, Prophet Abraham, who is believed in by both Muslims and Christians. That sacrifice which he made, something which is highly admired and honored, this is what is being honored. This is what is being commemorated. So for a Christian to offer uh, his greetings, they're not doing anything which is against the religion in the sense of the teachings of Christianity. No. That sacrifice is something confirming part of the beliefs of Christianity. Similarly, the Eid, the end of fasting, Eid al-Fitr, the period of fasting, this was a practice of Jesus himself. He fasted. And when he broke the fast, he ate the Eid. The end of fasting. This is what Muslims do at the end of the fasting and food is shared with those people around in giving thanks to God for the food that he has given. For a Christian to say, Eid Mubarak and Eid al-Fitr, this is nothing against the religious principles. No paganism, no nothing in there which, which could be said to be against the teachings of Christianity. So, for a Christian to say Eid Mubarak, it's no problem in terms of their religious beliefs. But for a Muslim to say Merry Christmas, this is in direct, open opposition to what they believe. If they did so, they would be doing so as hypocrites. And Islam, you know, does not like hypocrisy. We believe in one God. We believe in the practice of religion based on revelation. That's what we declare when we say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad may God's peace and blessings be upon him was the messenger of Allah who brought the way based on revelation the religion based on revelation and that's an obligation on every Muslim to uphold that because of that, it is not allowed for them to offer such greetings. I know some may go on to say, well, you know, we Christians are um, very accommodating and, you know, flexible. And we get along with people, so we can offer these kind of greetings. But you Muslims, you're very extreme and, you know, hard-headed and, you know, you just... Well, it might seem so. However, if we look at it from the point of view of beliefs and practices, what we really see, I mean, what is being expressed here is that principles in Christianity don't have too much value. They can be bent and twisted and whatever according to circumstances. This is why if you ask, went back a hundred years ago and you asked a Christian, scholar or follower what is the position of Christianity to homosexuality they would say this an abomination one of the greatest of evils however today you will find Christians ministers 
people in churches, etc., defending homosexuality. Finding excuses, you know, I, I read when I, in California, one, I listened to one minister there, he was explaining that it's really about what he calls just love. You know, as long as your love is just, right, there's justice in it, it doesn't matter who it is you love, whether it's male or female or, you know, <laughs> this is uh, making up his own religion. You know, this is a term now which I've, I've heard, actually, he was not the first one to say it, I've heard a number of people use terminology. Just love. Love with justice. And this is sort of becoming part of the foundation for the legal system approach towards homosexuality also. What they call consenting adults. The same kind of principle. That is the approach of Christianity. It will change as times change. No problem go back to the time of Christ and you look at the women who were around Christ, you know, as they are portrayed in the church today when they paint pictures of Mary and you know, even though it's clear in the uh, Old Testament Ten Commandments that it's prohibited to make any graven images, but in any case it's very common now in the churches you'll find them painting pictures of Mary, Mother of God Mary, Mother of Jesus Mary Magdalene and all the different others. But always when they're painted, they're painted having these scarves, loose flowing, long clothing, not exposing their bodies. And when we look at the first, the early generation of nuns coming out of Catholicism, that's the way they were dressed. Whereas when we look around today, we see the average female will be wearing clothes which can expose as much as possible. Even the nuns that have shortened their dresses and their sleeves and the thing used to cover, you know, the habits they call which used to cover them. Maybe just a little thing on the top of their head now with little pieces on the side. It's modified and changed with the time. So the truth, what was right and what was good in the time of Jesus is no longer right and good. It's inappropriate. Whereas the Muslim view, the Islamic view, is that what is right and good in the time of any prophet is right and good for all times. The truth is the truth. It's not something which varies from time to time, place to place, people to people. You know, everything is relative. This is what sort of, you know secular civilizations tries to promote now you know everything is relative one man's meat is another man's poison you know what Hitler saw as good we all look at as being bad you know I mean, this is playing with people's minds because in fact what is really evil what is wrong which has been defined by the prophets this remains a constant and unless the truth is maintained, the way of life that was brought by the prophets is maintained, then people deviate. And when they deviate, they go on the path of Satan. And this is why you will find, coming out of those who have deviated, the worst of ills, sicknesses, suicide, America, which is, you know, considered like the top in technology, but the rate of suicide is is incredible and you have millions of people who live and die on the streets homeless people millions and they're talking about also a, a, a number of millions of people like 30 something million people who are impoverished who are in a state of virtual starvation this is why a number of people in the states are saying what are we doing sending all this food out aid and so on so on our people in our own country are not receiving this aid there are people who are dying of malnutrition not, they're having food but it's not sufficient for them to develop themselves properly this is the peak of technology but they have deviated from the path of God and religion has followed behind them 
When we come back to the issue, as I raised in the very beginning, why it is that Muslims who believe in the miraculous virgin birth of Jesus would not celebrate the birth of Jesus. I explained because of the pagan origin. But I mentioned, considering also that Muslims in many parts of the world celebrate the birthday of Muhammad. May Allah's peace and blessings be on both of them. Now I just mentioned that the, the, the celebration of birthdays is of pagan origin. So the question now arises, should Muslims be celebrating the birthday of Prophet Muhammad? May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. And based on what I have presented to you, it is obvious that it is not correct. Because, like Prophet Jesus, no one knows the exact date of birth of Prophet Muhammad. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. Though people have commonly chosen the 12th of Rabi al Awal, this is most definitely the day on which he died. But the day on which he was born, the historians, Muslim scholars, are not agreed. So, the idea of celebrating that birthday is, becomes wrong from the point that we don't even know the exact date. It becomes wrong again from the point, as I mentioned, that the celebration of birthdays is of pagan origin. The Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, like Prophet Jesus, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, did not celebrate his birthday. Nor did his followers, his disciples, his immediate companions celebrate his birthday. And the Islamic teaching which defines what is acceptable and what is not acceptable in the form of the Quran, which is pure revelation without any kind of distortions, it has no foundation for the celebration of the birthday of the Prophet. And the Sunnah, or the way of Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, there is nothing in his way which supports that practice. In fact, based on his own statement, such a practice is simple celebration of the birthday of the Prophet is in fact sinful because Allah has said that the religion was complete in the time of the Prophet Muhammad may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him when Allah said today I have perfected for you completed for you your religion and the Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, himself said, مَا تَرَكْتُ شَيْئًا يُقَرِّبُكُمْ إِلَى اللَّهِ إِلَّا وَأَمَرْتُمْ I have not left aside anything which would bring you closer to Allah except that I have commanded you to do it. Anything, because when we do any act of this, of this uh, nature, this, the act of celebration of the Prophet's birthday, this is an act of worship. It is an, it's a religious act. It's an act which we believe is pleasing to God. For it to be pleasing to God, it had to have been sanctioned by the Prophet himself. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he also had said, مَنْ أَحْدَثَ فِي أَمْرِنَا مَا لَيْسَ مِنْهُ فَهُوَ رَدْ Whoever brings something new, in this affair of ours, of Islam, which is not a part of it, has no foundation in the Qur'an and the Sunnah, فَهُوَ رَدْ It is rejected, unacceptable to Allah. So, from that, we can conclude that Christmas has no place in Islam. It is not allowable for Muslims to celebrate Christmas, to join in those celebrations, 
to give the greetings of Christmas. And also that those who celebrate the birthday of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, they are doing themselves harm because they are doing something which is not pleasing to Allah. It is something which is disliked by Allah. It is an innovation. And Islam is very strict about innovation. This is why if you were to go back 1400 years, back to the time of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, you would find that the general practice that he followed, he and his companions, the same practices followed by Muslims throughout the world. The more closely they follow it, the better off they are. The less they follow it, the worse off they are, both spiritually and materially. So, I didn't want this to be an especially long talk because the topic is not really that complicated. I just wanted to give you some insights into the origin of, Christian, of Christmas, you know, from a Christian point of view, Christian fellowship. So that, for those of you who are Muslims, as this time draws near, if you are invited to such celebrations, or you are asked to give the greetings, that you will be able to give an informed answer as to why you cannot take part in these things. And for those thinking Christians who want to find the truth, the way about which Jesus spoke, then I have also provided some information which is accessible, it's not very complicated. I just went to some encyclopedias, you know, and took from a Catholic uh, dictionary, etc. Just took from these basic sources which are available. You know, we can find out what is the origin of things, find out whether it in fact is an acceptable practice. Because religion is not something which is man made. In the sense that human beings are the ones that put it together as they feel like. If it is to be the religion of God, then it must be based on revelation. Everything that is done has its basis, foundation in revelation. And you will find that truly only in Islam. That whatever is ascribed to Islam, not necessarily ascribed to Muslims now, because you may find Muslims doing all kinds of things. Much of it not related to revelation. But in terms of the religion itself, which has remained pure in the sense that anyone who wants to know what is Islam, they can find out. And you will find that each and every practice, each and every principle, has its foundation in revelation. I would like to give uh, you all an opportunity now to express any questions you'd like to raise know on the topic of Christmas or the celebration of the Prophet's birthday which is called Maulid and Nabi or Maulud it's also called and uh, the practice of its celebration began in the 11th century right 11th century that is some four to five hundred years after the time in Egypt, the dynasty known as the Fatimid dynasty, they are the ones who first began to publicly celebrate it. And we also find another century later, the brother-in-law of Salahuddin, by the name of Al-Malik Muzaffar-Din Kokburi, celebrating at Arbala, the birthday of the Prophet. May Allah's peace and be upon him. This was described by Ibn Khalikan, historian. And this is the first uh, record amongst we could call Orthodox Muslim practices. This is, as I said, some five to six hundred years after the time of the Prophet. May Allah's peace and be upon him. So if you have any questions concerning matters.
uh, it is not a part of religion from what i understand it's not like five prayers or ramadan or if you don't celebrate it you're not a muslim it is not an innovation secondly what you are quoting about the was started by father mai it was i from what i understand it was by some islamic scholars that father mai that uh, sect was considered a heretic and uh, what i have read it was not started by them but by some other source and uh, i don't want to start a debate about this but i just want to make it very clear that those muslims who the better word would be that commemorate or something there's nothing celebration in that what is done is you read quran and the in arabic and the translation because in most of the world people read quran but don't understand it and it is not at all considered as a part of religion to be considered as a religion well let me beg to differ with my brother on all three points first being <coughs> that it is not considered a part of the religion <coughs> I would say that in most parts of the Muslim world if you express to them that you do not believe that this, this day should be celebrated you would find people looking at you very negatively people hold to it quite strongly and when they do it they do it believing that it is pleasing to God They're not going to do something which they don't believe is pleasing to God. They're doing this, whether it's reading the Quran in that circumstance. And as I said, you mentioned that what is done in the Maulid or Maulud is just reading the Quran. That may be in your small circle. But when we go around the Muslim world, we find something else. We find celebrations looking like Christmas. people singing songs and you know even dancing and music and you know all kinds of stuff going on and much of these songs they call qawali and all these different types of you know qasaid and things which are used when you look into the meanings of what are being said in these various verses of poetry they are attributing to prophet muhammad may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him attributes which belong only to allah so you find shirk in much of what is recited And as I said, the practices go far beyond what you speak of. Maybe some people, a few, maybe um, people have reflected more on the religion, realizing that these other practices are a bit extreme, and they try to bring it down to something simpler, you know, just reading Quran and so on and so on. But I will question them, why do you pick that day to read Quran as a group? Because you believe that's the day on which the Prophet was born. So you are celebrating his birthday. And as I pointed out, the celebration of a birthday is prohibited in Islam. It is pagan in its origin. Muslims did not celebrate birthdays. Nor did Jews, followers of Moses, etc. Celebration of birthday was known amongst the Romans, the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Persians. These are the people who were not following Egyptians. Not, I don't mean Muslim Egyptians. I mean like the pharaohs. So please don't take this as <laughs> any personal attack or anything, okay? Uh, the, the people, you know, peoples of the past, the pagan peoples, these are those who celebrated birthdays. So for, for us to start that celebration, see, and as I said, when a person does that act, they do it believing that it is pleasing to God. And whatever act, this is the, this is the Islamic definition of worship. Whatever act that you do, which is pleasing to God, this is an act of worship. This is why the whole of the Muslim's life becomes an act of worship. You see, we don't separate, you know, and have out the secular kind of our actions that we have, you know, the secular acts that we do which are separate from our religious acts. No. The religion encompasses, that's the thing about Islam that is unique, that it has, there is no separation between the mundane and the secular and the religious. No, it is all one. It is all encompassed. And whatever we do, we are supposed to do it believing that this is pleasing to God. And how can we know whether it is pleasing to God or not? To use our minds, to think, well, 
I think the Prophet would like if I celebrated his birthday. Who are you? Who are you to think that? Did you ask him? No. Now, if it was something good to do, something pleasing to Allah, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu already said that he did not leave anything which would bring us closer to Allah. That is, that is pleasing to Allah, because if it's pleasing to Allah, when we do it, we come closer to Allah. He did not leave anything which would bring us closer to Allah, except that he told us to do it. Finish. It means there is nothing new we can add to the religion which will bring us closer to Allah. Which will be pleasing to Allah, which the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu did not already inform us. Not necessarily explicitly, because this is why we have what we call fiqh. The application of the sharia, the divine revelation when we apply it, from place to place, depending on circumstances, we may apply it in slightly different manners. This is the fiqh. And this we believe, when a person does apply the law, although it is a human being applying it, we believe this is pleasing to God. Its foundation is based on revelation. The actual ruling that we may take, for example, when Muslims say it is prohibited to smoke hashish. Now, hashish was not around at the time of the Prophet Muhammad. Well, on peace and blessings be upon But the foundations of intoxicants were already prohibited in the Quran and the Sunnah. So, if we find anything which functions in a similar manner, we can prohibit it. This is the fiqh, using our understanding in the application of the law. But the foundation of what we're doing is there in the Qur'an or the Sunnah. But now when we come to celebrating the Prophet's birthday, where is the foundation? What is the foundation on which we are going to base that practice? The celebration... Our sister is asking, the celebration of birthdays I've already pointed out. This is pagan in its origin. As Muslims, we do not partake of pagan celebrations. The Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, had said, مَن تَشَبَّهَ بِقَوْمٍ فَهُوَ مِنْهُمْ Whoever imitates the ways of a people is of them. You take part in the pagan rituals, then you are like a pagan. So, we avoid practices which are specifically related back to paganism. It doesn't mean, for example, that the suit, the jacket, the tie, came from America. These people weren't Muslims, so it is prohibited for you. No, I'm not saying. Because this has not got any kind of religious significance. It's not linked to... If it were, for example, in the form of a robe which is worn by Catholic priests, for example. If they had a particular robe, they do have different robes that they wear for certain uh, ceremonies, etc. For a Muslim to take on that particular dress is prohibited. So, the practice of celebration of birthdays, Though celebration of birthdays in and of themselves are not considered a religious act in and of themselves. Because when people are celebrating the birthday of their children, they're not thinking that this is something pleasing to Allah. This is just something, a, a custom which people do. This is how they're looking at it. So though it may not be looked at from a point of innovation in the religion here, it is looked at as prohibited from the point that it is of pagan origin was the practice of the pagans, those who worship idols, this is what they used to do, celebrate birthdays, give gifts on these birthdays. So for a Muslim, it would be prohibited for them to be involved in such practices. The national day, from an Islamic perspective, is also prohibited. To celebrate the birth of the nation, this is prohibited because the Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, when he left Mecca and came to Medina, he found the people of Medina having a number of different celebrations. And he asked them, what is this for? And they told him, we did this for this, that, for that. He said, well, it's here. 
We have only two celebrations in Islam. Eid al-Fitr, celebration at the end of the fasting, and Eid al-Adha, celebration of Prophet Abraham's sacrifice. That's it. It means any other celebration which is done on a yearly basis, which is called Eid. So it's called Eid because it comes from Ada Yahud, you know, thing which comes back every time, every year on the same day. That, any of those kind of celebrations are prohibited Islamically. Whether it's New Year's Day, National Day, whatever. According to what I'm saying now, what you do is you try to sit them down and say, Do you know where Christmas came from? You try to educate them. Rather than leave them in a state of ignorance and encourage them in their ignorance. We know that Christmas uh, celebration is uh, very important in the Christian uh, point of view. Now, you will notice that they have a strong invitation to, uh, to their religion. Now, are you emphasizing or you are emphasizing that this Christmas has no foundation or basis at all in the Old Testament or in the New Testament? Yes, this is what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying, actually. This is what I quoted from you. The scholars, Western scholars of Christianity have said that themselves. Christmas has no basis in the Gospels or in the uh, practice of Jesus, Old Testament or New Testament. It has no foundation. This was the whole point of what I expressed here. The 25th of December, where it came from. Celebration of the birth, where did it come from? The church prohibited it at one point. The early generation, the early few, first few hundred years, they prohibited it. They banned it. Later on, those who were in favor of it were pushing paganism. It became popular. And again, back in the 17th century, they banned it again. So if it were something which had a foundation in the Gospels, historically, then the church would never have banned it. Uh, Allah ask uh, Mary, Virgin Mary, uh, shake the palm and uh, the...